And uh, I thank the elders who were here and others for helping to pass out our Advent Christmas letter. It includes a schedule of all the things that are happening in our pastoral charge over the coming seasons of Advent and Christmas. And um, if you have family or friends or neighbors who are part of our church community, please pick up a copy of those letters to share, to take to them. Let the people know who are uh, passing them out today so we can keep track and don't end up delivering one that uh, already has uh, a newsletter. Uh, next Sunday, for the first Sunday of Advent, our services are, as usual, Salt Springs at 9.15, here at Limesburg at 11, and 2 o'clock at the Maritime Mount Fellows Nursing Home. We have not offered ministry to the nursing home <laughs> residents in Pictou since March of 2020, when the pandemic, pandemic began. So we have, they're opening up again to welcome churches to come. So next Sunday, we will be at the Odd Fellows at 2 o'clock. Um, St. Luke's will take the lead in this service with uh, Julie Winans, our organist there, playing for that service along with me. And any choir or congregation, you're welcome to come and offer this outreach to the folks at the Maritime Odd Fellows Nursing Home. You'll see in the newsletter, we're going to Shiretown in December. So we're, we're connecting with both those in the Advent season. And uh, speaking of Advent, Anne Garmin has stars, the uh, gifts for the Star <coughs> Wish program. So if any would like to get a star, you can see Anne today after the service. There are only a limited number of them. That's part of our White Gift Outreach. And, um, but there's a list of things you could also bring on White Gift Sunday if you don't get a star. I think those are the things that I want to share with you today. There.
we come together here, I want to uh, tell you a little story. In Mark's Gospel in the Bible, we hear about Jesus welcoming love for children. The story is this. People were bringing little children to Jesus so he could bless them. But the disciples spoke sternly to them and didn't think that children should be welcomed to Jesus. He was much too important. But Jesus said, that's not the way it should be. Jesus, in fact, was upset. And he said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as little children that God's kingdom belongs. And then Jesus took up the children in his arms, and he blessed them, and he welcomed them to share God's love. And so it is in baptism we celebrate God's love. Here at the font, and this is the font we call this, it's like a fountain, except it doesn't bring water up, the water's going to go in it. Here at the font, we claim for children and ourselves the gift of God's grace, which flows like life-giving waters, renewing us as children of God's Spirit. By baptism, we are also welcomed. We are welcomed into the family of faith. And here at the font, we proclaim our identity as members of Christ's church. It's also true that in baptism, we are named as those who belong to Christ and his community, the church. Here at the font, we profess our faith, and we promise to live as best we can as disciples of Jesus with God's help. And you know what? Loretta didn't get, get much of that, did you, Loretta? Did you understand all that? <laughs> no. And that's okay. Because when we baptize little children, parents, and we, the whole church, make promises to help those who are baptized young to learn these truths, to learn this way of faith in Jesus, and to grow up to follow in the path of Christ and to be a member of the church. This is Lynn Langell, as uh, some of you, most of you know. Lynn is the clerk of session here at Lyons Brook, and she's going to present this family. On behalf of the Congregation of Lyons Brook United Church, and with the approval of the session of Salt Springs, Scott Springs, and Lyons Brook Catholic Church, which has the responsibility for worship and the sacraments, I present to you these parents, Emily and Brandon Marshall, who bring your daughter, Loretta, for baptism into membership in the Christian Church. Thank you, Lynn. And also here are Douglas and Philip, Loretta's big brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to invite you to profess your faith and make your commitment. Emily and Brandon, do you believe in God who is the creator of humankind and in God's love? If so, respond as I do. Do you believe that God has been made known to us in Jesus of Nazareth, who lived and died and lives again? If so, yes, I do. Yes, I do. And do you believe also that God's Spirit is active to direct and strengthen us in this world? If so, yes, I do. The Church of Jesus Christ is called to resist evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and the word of Jesus Christ. So I ask you, do you promise to be faithful members sharing in the ministry of Jesus and following in Christ's way as best you are able? Emily and Brandon, if so, say, yes, I do, with the help of God. There's the presence of God right there, <laughs> giving hugs to her brothers. And lastly, will you do your best to provide a Christian home for your child and offer the nurture of the Christian church in her life? And when old enough, encourage her to seek confirmation of these vows as her own. If so, respond, I will with the help of God and our church community. I will with the help of God and our church community. Okay, Philip and Douglas, I'm going to ask you a question. I know it's a question you'll understand. Will you love your little sister and help her to know God's love? If so, say, yes, I will. Okay, we got God. That's just as good. Yeah. As a community of faith, we receive and welcome this child today in Jesus' name. Please stand as you are able to affirm the church's commitment. 
And I ask you, will you, the people of Lionsbrook and Scottsford United Churches, support this child and these parents with constant love, wholesome example, Christian teaching, and faithful prayer? If so, oh, sorry. And will you commit yourself to building a community which is guided by God's Spirit, in which all are welcomed and affirmed as a gift of God and nurtured in Christian faith? If so, please respond, we will, God being our helper. We will, God being our helper. Thank you. You may be seated. Look at me. The look of Douglas. And here's great grandma. <laughs> We've got two great grandmas. Two great grandmas in the house. <laughs> and grandma in the house. Yeah. That's very special. Very, very special, these generations to celebrate God's love in Loretta. Philip and Douglas, I'd like your help. Would you be willing to help me? In order for me to baptize your sister, we need to have water in this boat. And I have water here. Would you help pour it in? Maybe you could each pour some. You want to start, Philip? Right in that bowl, right there, okay? I'll just hold the bottom. Excellent. Douglas, could you help me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can I do it for you? Okay. There you go. May God's grace be in these waters of daily use, which we use today to welcome and to bless. My hands are cold, right? Because it's chilly in here. It's chilly. How's this? You look very pretty today. What is the name of this child? Home name. Loretta Grace Marshall. Thank you. Loretta Grace Marshall. I baptize you in the name of God who created you. In the name of Jesus, God's Son who redeemed you. And in the name of the Holy Spirit who sustains you. May God bless you and keep you. May the love of God and of all of us here forever surround you. And may the Holy Spirit grant you peace all your life. Amen. Amen. See this? Like <laughs> it is with joy today that we welcome Loretta into the fellowship of Christ's Church. We celebrate her as a child of God. We surround her in our love and our care. And we promise to grow with her in the knowledge and in the love of God. Thanks be to God. Love 
when we celebrate the gift you are today, the gift to your family, to all the generations of your family, and the gift to us in this church community, and the gift to this world. God bless you in the journey, and we look forward to sharing it with you. And this is the baptismal certificate. And thank you for being such great helpers today. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so sweet. Blessings to you all. And actually, it's time for Sunday school, so all the youngsters who are here, yay, you get to go. See ya. See ya. See ya. See ya. Our reading this morning is Colossians 1, 11 to 20. In Christ, all the fullness of God has pleased you well. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from God's glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to God, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. The Lord has rescued us from the power of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. Jesus is crucified and mocked. 
When the soldiers came to the place that was called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leader stopped him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, God's chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you were the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other one rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of commendation. And we indeed have been condemned justly, but we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It can often be said of us that it's like we live in two worlds at one time. In fact, we move to the beat of a different drum, it seems, sometimes, as followers of Jesus. According to the prevailing culture, we don't always see things the same. That is, if we are being faithful to the way of Jesus, which our religion is based upon. Of course, we have our own unique and particular patterns and values and ways of marking time. Today, we welcomed Loretta into this Christian community, this Christian way of life. And we've made promises that we want her to learn what this culture of our faith is what it means to be a child of God and to be a follower of Jesus in this world. And as I said, sometimes it feels like we've got one foot here and one foot as a Christian because sometimes they are quite different, the ways of the world and our ways of faith. For instance, we have our own calendar as Christians. Yeah, we all have calendars up in our homes that say today's November 20th and there's another, uh, what, six weeks left in this current year. But... As Christians, we follow a different calendar as well, called the Christian calendar, which has different seasons. That uh, calendar follows the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus. And every year, we repeat that, that story following that calendar. And the seasons in our calendar are not spring, summer, winter, and fall. The seasons are Advent, Christmas, Epiphany. The seasons include um, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, creation time, and ordinary time. And our new year in the Christian calendar is not January 1st. It's next Sunday. The first Sunday of Advent begins a new year on the Christian calendar, so that makes this New Year's Eve. Woo! Well, okay, it's a little different than the world's New Year's Eve. I know on New Year's Eve, on the 31st of December, you know, we have parties and we uh, toast the new year in, we make resolutions, sometimes we go dancing, have special meals. Our New Year's Eve on the Christian calendar ends on a high note too. Slightly different though, of course. Ends on a very triumphant note. This Sunday on the Christian calendar is celebrated as Reign of Christ Sunday. And ends this year on a high note as we celebrate that Jesus is the Christ. And that his reign is part of our experience and our life today that we affirm his power and his rule or reign in our lives, if not in the world as a whole. Today we proclaim with the scriptures that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the head of the body of the church. We proclaim that Jesus is the one through whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And that Jesus is the one who was before all things came to be and through whom all things came to be, what theologians call the preeminent Christ. That Jesus is the one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. 
That's what we celebrate at the end of our Christian calendar year. <coughs> as Christians, we believe that Jesus is all of these. And we refer to him as the Lord of love, as the Prince of Peace, as the Son of God, and as the teacher whom we seek to follow. We profess him to be the ruler of our hearts and of our lives as we celebrate his reign as song. But wait a minute, <laughs> something's off, isn't it? Feels like something's a little strange here. The gospel today gave us a picture of a man bleeding and suffering, being mocked and dying on a cross. A person who had virtually no material wealth in this world and was certainly not born into the ruling classes of the time, but into a humble peasant family. One who was put to death as a common criminal, executed by crucifixion. This is the one who we affirm as our ruler, the ruler of our lives. This is the one to whom we ascribe glory and power. The one whom the Roman leaders scoffed at and the crowds made fun of calling him the king of the Jews. Really? This is the guy who we call God's Messiah? The one who could not or at least would not save himself that day as the ones hanging with him encouraged? This is the one we profess to be our savior? Someone who couldn't even save himself? It is kind of quirky, isn't it, when you really stop and think about it? That the one who we proclaim to be the ultimate one who reigns in God's power is the <clears throat> one whose life was like that. But it is true. It's our faith that Jesus came into this world as a helpless baby, just like us. His first cradle was very crude. It was a feed box in a stable. And we believe that this baby who was given the name Jesus, which means God saves, quite ironic, isn't it, is the one whom we follow, even now in 2022. It is our faith that Jesus lived as one of us a life just like ours, a life of sweat and tears, of conflicts and joys, of successes and pleasures. And it's our faith that Jesus died, really died, not pretend death, that he really died there on the cross, <laughs> an agonizing and painful death. And it's our faith also that Jesus was fully human. He understands what it's like to be who we are. But at the same time, we say we believe that Jesus was fully divine. That's a stretch. How do you put the two of them together? That he lived as full a life filled with the sacred as it is possible for a human being to do. And it's our faith that Jesus was not ultimately defeated by death or by the evil that people can visit on each other, but lives yet, lives as one to whom we look up to as our Redeemer and our ruler. You know the old story used to say about, like if a Martian came down to earth and they look around and say, how would they make sense of what we do and who we are, well, put that in the context of the Christian faith. If a Martian came down to church and heard us talking today about a ruler who died on a cross, who had no power, who had no money, they might think, what are you talking about? At the very least, they think we must be confused, if not completely disconnected from reality. To hear us talking about this poor man from the backwoods of Nazareth, who was arrested and executed as our Savior, our son. How is it that we can talk of the reign of Christ as ruler while it's clear that he was completely powerless against the forces of the regimes of his time and was put to death? Well, for me, we can say these things partly because of the events of Easter and an empty cross and an empty tomb. And it is in part because of the experience of that band of his followers who experienced his presence with them after the cross and were encouraged and uh, given power and strength and conviction to carry on his mission, devoting themselves to the coming of God's kingdom here on earth and doing whatever they could do 
to bring that kingdom about, just as Jesus did. Sometimes we call it today the kingdom, to try to take away some of the hierarchy of that image. You know, a kingdom is where everybody's kin, everybody, our sisters and brothers, sharing in the love of God as children, where no one is deemed lesser than others, where all are blessed by a life in which justice, love, and peace reign supreme. We can uphold such seemingly contradictory concepts as one who was put to death on a cross but had power, power to reign, because of how people came to understand who he was, fully human, fully divine, the Messiah. The nature of this Jesus and the story of his birth and his death, his cross and his reign confronts us with some very perplexing paradoxes. Webster's Dictionary defines a paradox as a seemingly contradictory statement that may nonetheless be true. The disgrace and death of the cross being upheld as a sign of dignity and power and life, that's a paradox. The cross representing a crushing defeat of an innocent man and of what is right, while at the same time representing a moral and cosmic victory. That's a paradox. The cross as a means of snuffing out a virtuous life, which seems to be a denial of God, and yet is a symbol to people of the victory of God. That's a paradox. What seems to be contradictory is true. A revolutionary man who had little power according to the understanding of power, from the point of view of earthly rulers and principalities, is proclaimed on this last Sunday of the Christian year to be the Messiah, the Savior, the Sovereign of our lives. That is a great paradox. This uh, observance of the reign of Christ at the end of the Christian calendar year is a relatively latecomer to our traditions. In fact, it was um, created by Pope Pius IX back in 1925, so not even 100 years ago now, that this idea of celebrating the reign of Christ came to be. In fact, 1925 rings a bell, maybe? It's the same year our United Church of Canada was created by Church Union. That's when the reign of Christ was initiated by Pope Pius. The church had always celebrated images of Jesus as king, as lord, as sovereign, but the church really, really needed to do it at that time. Just think back. On that first celebration of the reign of Christ Sunday, 97 years ago, Mussolini <coughs> had been head of Italy for three years. A rabble-rouser by the name of Hitler Adolf Hitler had just been released from jail, and his Nazi party was growing in popularity. And the world, at that time, was in the grip of a Great Depression. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? My father used to say, history repeats itself. We could be describing today, but the violence and the dictators in the world and the kind of uh, economic situation that we're all living in, at that time, Pius IX asserted that nonetheless, nonetheless of all these realities, Christ rules over the universe. And this observance at the end of the Christian year became the church's great nevertheless to the world's realities. Despite corrupt kings and queens and monarchs, despite cruel dictators and despots, despite severe situations and problems which plagued the earth and the earth's people, this day gave the church an opportunity to affirm that, nevertheless, Jesus is Christ, is sovereign and Savior. And in that affirmation, people found some hope in the midst of very hopeless situations. People found some meaning in the midst of a very meaningless experience. And people found some stability in the midst of chaos. The ruler whose reign we proclaim had his beginnings in a humble cradle. His crown was made of thorns. His, thorn was, his, uh, his th throne was a cross. But his reign is real 
even though it is very countercultural, does not make much sense from the point of view of the way the world thinks. For he rules through the power of love and doing the right thing. He is Christus Paradox, the one who has power through all that seems contrary to power. And as we come to the end of another year and following the way of Jesus, we make this audacious claim once again. Christ is Lord of our lives. And his reign reveals to us a holy kingdom wherein things are turned upside down. Where the real power comes through comp compassion and love. Where the first will be last and the last will be first. Where those who save their lives will end up losing it. If that's all you think about is saving your life. And those who give of themselves for others will find themselves and gain their full life. Those things, <laughs> they don't make much sense to a lot of people. Sometimes we may even shake our heads and think, does this make sense to us? But to those who have encountered Jesus and who seek to walk in his way, it does make sense. For in the one who rules from a cross and whose reign intends justice and right relationships among all people, God's power and purpose is truly revealed. Paradox is the Lord. A woman by the name of Sylvia Dunstan who was a member of our United Church of Canada from Ontario, a leader in our church, who died quite young, wrote a beautiful hymn, pulling together all these ironic and paradoxical understandings of our faith. Let's sing it together now. You, Lord, are both Lamb and Shepherd. It's in Voices United, number 210. <laughs>
Um, because Loretta didn't understand a whole lot of that today, we're going to have to teach her that as she grows up. And we encourage that someday she'll affirm for herself what we did for her today. She'll confirm that baptism and that membership. So we're still talking about membership right now because um, we celebrate that we belong to Christ's body, the church, through particular fellowships, through congregations. And um, today we're going to welcome, in a formal way, people who you would never say were new members to the church. Because really they're not new members to the church. They were all, these four folks, baptized um, long ago and were confirmed in their faith long ago. Not always in the United Church tradition, but in other traditions sometimes. And for us as a church, we affirm baptism no matter what Christian church does it. Now, whether it's a priest or a minister or a pastor, we welcome folks acknowledging their membership in the church. Today, we have received a request from some folks to reaffirm their faith and to uh, become members uh, formally of Lionsburg United Church. And the session has acted to receive them <laughs> back in February. <laughs> So it's taken us a little while to get here to actually <laughs> affirm this publicly with you, the congregation. Um, but today we take a moment to acknowledge the action of the session and to officially welcome them into this fellowship of faith. On behalf of the session, I present Linda and Bruce O'Brien and Florence and John Van Dien, whom we formally welcome into membership in Lionsbrook United Church. And I'd welcome you folks to come up here if you would do so. So we can welcome you. As I said, they're not strangers. <laughs> They've been active here for a good while. If you folks can come on this side as well. Linda and Bruce and John and, and uh, Florence, it's a joy for us today to actually uh, be together as a congregation, to welcome you. Uh, as members of Lionsbrook United Church formally. And I want to ask you, do you recommit yourself to worship God, to serve Christ faithfully, to share the life and the work of the church through this congregation of Lionsbrook United? If so, respond, I do, God being my helper. I'm going to ask you folks to stand. And with your bullets in the hand, to receive these new members, to share the words of support that are printed there. Together, as the people of Lionsbrook and Scottsbury United Churches, we celebrate your reaffirmation of baptismal faith as you are welcomed into membership in Christ Church among us. We promise to continue to support you, to walk with you, and grow with you. With God's help, we will live out our baptism and our membership in Christ Church as a loving community in Jesus Christ, nurturing one another in faith, upholding one another in prayer, encouraging one another in God's word. Let us pray. Loving God, by your spirit, we are enlivened to be your servant people. We pray today that you would bless Linda and Bruce, Florence and John, as they're welcomed into membership in your church amongst us. May the welcome that we extend be a witness to your Spirit's presence within us. And may your love unite us all as sisters and brothers in Christ. May we share together in the mission of your church, serving the world you love, and caring for one another in Christ's love. Amen. <laughs> you folks may be seated. And so it is today. February 23rd was a long time ago when the session decided this. But we are glad today, Linda and Bruce and Florence and John, to welcome you to share in the privileges and the responsibilities of membership in this congregation of Lionsbrook United Church. May you continue to find here as members a faith community which is a place of spiritual nurture to your soul, a place of love and support where you may live out your faith in service to God and the world. May God bless you and grant you joy and peace all the journey to you. Amen. Normally we shake hands, but I'm just going to do this. <laughs> Blessings. <laughs> we are indeed 
very grateful that you are part of this community of faith with us. With the certificate of membership, Florence and John. Today is titled Becoming Their Child's Hero. On November 20, countries around the world celebrate Universal Children's Day, also called World Children's Day. The date marks the anniversary of the UN General Assembly adopting both the Declaration and the Convention on Children's Rights. On the same day, Restorative Justice Week kicks off. It's a perfect time to raise up the needs of children with incarcerated parents. The all too often forgotten, invisible, or ignored victims of the criminal justice system. No one knows how many children in Canada are affected by the incarceration of a parent. Back in 2007, the guesstimate was 357,604. But advocates think that with the increase in the prison population, the number is much higher. While every situation is unique, many children with incarcerated parents face trauma, family instability, social isolation, and economic insecurity. On the inside, parents struggle to stay connected to their kids let go of shame, and deepen parenting skills so they can successfully unite their family when they are released. That's why Parkland Restorative Justice, a mission and service partner based in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, runs an eight-week parenting course for male inmates called Dad Hero, an acronym for helping everyone realize opportunities. Develop in the partnership with the Canadian Families and Corrective Network, CFCN, the course is designed to educate dads about parenting, <coughs> how to communicate with their child, and how to work with a co-parent. Afterward, the dads meet regularly in a group that continues to provide support after their release. A lot of people don't think about men inside prisons as a hero. In fact, we told the men the name of the program. Some of them said, that doesn't resonate with me. I don't really feel like a hero to my kids, but I want my children to look up to me, to think that I have value and worth, <coughs> that I have information to give them, and can be a good parent that is aspiring to be a hero, says Luis Lenardi. Executive Director of the CFCN, we all want the same things for these men. We want them to come out of prison, to re-offend less, to be with their families, to start a pro-social and productive life, and to move into society in a well-balanced way. Families want their dads to come back. No one is disposable, and no child should feel forgotten. Thank you for helping to build stronger families and for believing everyone can be a hero. Certainly, uh, we have permission to make us stop and pause and think about things from a bit of a different perspective. Let us bow together in prayer. Holy God, from the moment of our birth into this world, we are always growing and changing and becoming, seeking to become your faithful children in the pattern of Jesus, whose reign is love and whose way is justice whose vision is abundant life for everyone. Help us, O oh God, to continue growing and learning and maturing in faith, no matter how old we are. And lead us into a deeper understanding of your reign among us and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We give thanks today for the faith which we share and for how that faith informs our lives both personally and communally. We give thanks for this church this community of Christ's disciples, with whom we are blessed to learn and serve and work and grow. As we bring to mind now people who face uncertainties and fears, people who are carrying heavy burdens and facing terrible struggles, 
May our prayers today focus love's energy for good. Let us not be overwhelmed by the chaos which seems so uh, prevalent in the world right now as we pray for the many who cry out for food and shelter, who cry out for an end to violence and greater peace, especially the people in Ukraine. For the people who cry out for a more responsible caring for creation and for healing and for wrongs to be righted. In the efforts of people of goodwill and the sharing of resources toward a vision of justice, we pray that your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Today we hold into the light of your love those known to us who are in special need of strength and comfort and care. We pray for those who are ill, who are recovering from disease and surgery, and those who are not. For those who are worn down and wearied by problems that never seem to go away or just seem to get worse. And for those who feel isolated and alone. For those who are coping with losses of various kinds. God, for all whom we pray today, may Christ's love be made real through us and others. And may the offerings we give, either placed in the plates or through power, or the gifts of food for the food bank that we share today, be a means of furthering your realm here among us, proclaiming Christ as ruler of our lives and with his vision set in our sights and his love planted in our hearts. We seek to become all you would have us be. And we pray in the example of Jesus as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Final hymn is crowned with many crowns, number 211 in Voices United.
And may the Christ who loves with a wounded heart help you to love each other. And when you go out today, may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. You know, it is not always easy to be a Christian in this world. It's not always easy to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. But as you go seeking to do so, as members of the church and as his disciples, may the presence of God encourage you with hope. May the love of Christ strengthen you with power. And may the peace which is ours in the spirit of a risen Christ sustain you today and forever. Amen. Amen.